All right, let's get going. Um, I'm very happy uh, to welcome Phil Chilson today for our uh, seminar. Um, Phil is from the uh, University of Oklahoma, from the School of Meteorology, uh, where he is a professor. And uh, I guess most of you know him, actually. I'm sorry, I stay a little bit back here. Most of you know him, uh, his background is uh, radar meteorology largely, but then he branched off into many other things, and right now a fair amount of UAS work, okay? You know, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, spelled UAS, uh, just in case we all know that. <laughs> Sorry for that one. Uh, Phil got his bachelor uh, from Clemson University, uh, a master's uh, from the University of Florida, and a PhD uh, again back at Clemson University. Uh, PhD title thesis, uh, thesis titled Diabetic Forcing in Association with East Coast Winter Cyclogenesis, Gulf Stream Propagation and Dynamics. Nope. Nope? Nope. Then I copied and pasted it. <laughs> oh, big, big goof of mine. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing dual frequency measurements of precipitation. I forget the exact title of the dissertation. And I was so scared that this would happen to me. I was <laughs> copy and paste issue. It was, it was terrible. I apologize. Anyway, I hope the rest is uh, halfway right. Uh, that part I already confirmed. Uh, uh, postdoc he did in Katlenburg Lindau in uh, Germany. Uh, after that, he moved to uh, Kiruna, uh, where he spent uh, three years at the Institute for Space Physics. We actually bumped into him first time, long, long time ago. Um, then he spent uh, four years here at Ceres and at NOAA, and I actually don't know exactly what group. Um, it, was ETL, it, it was ETL at that time. ETL, yep. Uh, and then in 2005, he moved to uh, Oklahoma, where he has been a professor ever since. Uh, this year, um, he became the director of the new Center for Autonomous Sensing and, and Sampling. Uh, which is one of the important places for UAS uh, research in the country. Phil has uh, published uh, and, and co-authored and co-authored uh, over 70 uh, publications, so he's been quite prolific, and I hear there's one uh, just today, one more. So he uh, uh, stays very busy. Today's talk is uh, whether to fly development of unmanned aircraft <coughs> systems for atmospheric research at the University of Oklahoma. Phil, please. Okay, thank you. So there's many different ways you can approach this topic. It's um, in some respects somewhat new, some respects somewhat old. It's definitely rapidly growing. <clears throat> and I was trying to decide what kind of approach to take when making this, putting this uh, presentation together. <clears throat> so I decided to focus on work being done at the University of Oklahoma, although you know, I must say that there's a lot of other great research in this area that's being done, other institutions around the, the world. Um, also, I was trying to decide whether or not to dig in to a particular topic and really focus on the details or take a 30,000 foot view. And since it's about aircraft, I thought the 30,000 foot view would be appropriate. So I'm gonna hit upon different research directions um, some of these may inspire you know, research that you might want to be considering to do here. Um, and we'll just jump into it. And so unmanned aircraft systems as opposed to you know, unmanned aircraft vehicles or aerial vehicles, the system is the complete package. It's the ground station, it's the sensors, it's the platform. So the whole nine yards is what we call the UAS. And you know, we're obviously going to focus on small UAS. Uh, of course, there's many different um, sizes. And small UAS, according to FAA, is anything under 55 pounds. And we're going to focus on it for atmospheric um, research. So as a brief background, <clears throat> for boundary layer meteorology, we think that the UAS is a particularly attractive platform. Why? Because as we all know that the, the lower atmosphere, the boundary layer, is extremely complex. It's, way, it's woefully undersampled. It's um, spatially inhomogeneous. It's rapidly evolving dynamically. And so you have a, you're really hard pressed 
to get enough um, measurements in this area of the region, region of the atmosphere. Um, you know, we, we have towers and balloons, remote sensors, and, and so forth, even manned aircraft. But um, this is really a sweet spot for small UAS, as we hopefully will illuminate a little bit more throughout the, the context of this presentation. Um, this is a report that was put up by the um, National Research Council, and it and other reports, you know, demonstrate the need for getting more samples in the lower atmosphere. So why more samples in the lower atmosphere, as I, as I mentioned, is because it's, it's so dynamic. So you might get away with, you know, sounding here, sounding there, you know, aircraft flight here and there in the free atmosphere, but down in the lower atmosphere, it's, you need a lot more measurements. So what are some of the applications? <clears throat> well, we, we are thinking, coming from University of Oklahoma, where we seem to have a strong focus on um, severe weather. So look at tornado warnings as one example. Um, you look at the lead time for tornado warnings, and they were pretty abysmal back in the, well, abysmal is maybe too strong of a word, but back in the 80s, you know, we had you know, very long, very, very, very short lead times for um, tornado warnings. And then something came around, the um, WSR 88Ds. So once the 88Ds were put into place, we started noticing that there was this rapid, well, uptick in the lead times that we had for tornado warnings. But we've pretty much exhausted the improvements that we can get from the radars, and so it's flattened out. So what we need is some kind of a paradigm shift. And we're thinking that UAS could be one of those paradigm shifts. If you look at this diagram, which is a schematic of a um, tornadic storm, of course it's color-coded based on what the weather radars will see, and the weather radars are going to observe that which is the hydrometeors. But there are a lot of important dynamic flows coming in which are in regions where there are no hydrometeors. So this region of the storm are relatively undetected by the weather radars. So you gotta put other sensors out into the field. You know, if it's in a rapidly evolving system like this, then you don't really have often a lot of time to get your assets out there unless you have some kind of you know, Doppler on wheels or a smart radar or something of that variety. But then you're still on the ground, you know, looking up at the um, storm system. Well, this is where the UAS could play a strong role and able to go out, intercept, and interrogate the regions outside the storm. You don't have to actually fly into the storm itself. You can be in the in the environment around the storm where you're still getting measurements of the kinematics and thermodynamics of the um, system um, and still staying safely away from the storm and then giving these data back to the, the forecast office, for example. But even before the storms kick in, you, know, you can look at the onset of convection initiation. And so for that, we're advocating for a very operational approach of using um, small UAS to monitor the atmosphere and see when the storms might fire. But for that, you're going to need a, a system, which I'm going to describe later, uh, like a 3D mesonet system. So we are making the claim <clears throat> that small UAS will assist in the understanding of how storms are evolving and maybe even where they may fire for the convection initiation. But it's kind of a broad, it's kind of a bold statement to make without having the data to back it up because we don't have you know, whole fleets of UAS out sampling the atmosphere. So we're starting to look at the use of UAS for OSSEs and OSSEs. And right now I just focus on the observational system simulation experiments where, as you're probably familiar with, you can take a, a nature run and then you simulate the observations you do the data simulation, you put that into a, uh, into a verification, and then you can see how that compares with your nature run. Then you can start asking yourself such questions as, how many vehicles do I need? How high do I need to fly? Um, how often do I need to sample? 
what's the accuracy of the measurements that we need to obtain and things of that variety. Now, this diagram down here shows temperature, potential temperature and specific humidity over a range of about five hours. And so in the lower atmosphere, you know, again, it's no surprise, but we can see how rapidly <clears throat> lower atmosphere is evolving. And if you really want to get a handle on that, you need to have regularly scheduled observations of the lower atmosphere. So this is some, all oh, this is a bit of a teaser just to kind of give a background and a uh, motivation for the types of work that we're doing at OU. So <clears throat> let's focus on some of the work that we're doing at OU. And so whether UAS in general is really gaining momentum. You'll see more and more papers coming out. There, there was a special session held at the AMS annual meeting um, last year. There's going to be another special session at the AMS annual meeting this year on using UAS for atmospheric measurements. Um, so as far as UAS and OU goes, we've been on a upward trajectory. And I'm going to talk about different components of this as we go along, but I would say around 2009 is when we got started with our weather UAS project. And I can tell you that, <clears throat> wow, I knew nothing about it back then. If I had known now what I knew then, I might not would have started. But you know, you naively go into an area with enthusiasm and excitement about the data you're going to collect, and then you realize, wow, this is, there's a lot to this. But still, 2009, we got started. I got some, some minimal amount of funding. I got a student, and we started on this um, path. A big part of our development came in March of 2013, and we had a team of about six or eight individuals. We had our first civilian COA, Certificate of Authorization, which is the authorization you need from the FAA in order to fly an unmanned aircraft for, for research. So we had our first civilian COA operation in the state of Oklahoma, and it seems I know this picture is kind of small, but this little aircraft here, which this one tall dude here is holding in his, his hand, is about this big. And for that, we had to have four trained observers, all with class two medical exams. We had to have a pilot in command, and we had to have a computer specialist, and then an RC pilot. The only person in that picture who was non-essential is this gentleman here, which is me. I was just there to be professorial and, 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 and talk the talk and make sure everybody was doing their thing. <clears throat> Back in February 2014, while I was here doing my sabbatical, we, um, court, we ran an experiment called LATTE out at the BAO. I'll talk very briefly about that. And then in May of 2015, we hosted an international um, conference on UAS or atmospheric research in Norman. August 2015, we started a $6 million um, UAS-related project funded by NSF. And I'll talk more about some of these points as we go along. So that was pretty new. Um, in April of 2016, we started the center, which um, Holga mentioned. And then as of August 1, which was what, six days ago, we have a funded program from NOAA, which we're calling EPIC. So we, we're developing partnerships, and we're thinking that the future looks pretty bright. So this is the little platform which I told you about that needed a, an army of people in order to fly because it was such a terror to the airspace. Um, you know, but it's, it's somewhat underwhelming, but as a sensor Platform, but you know, it allowed us to get some, I think, good measurements of the lower atmosphere and helped us to start getting our feet wet, as it were, about all the nuances of doing UAS measurements. What we would typically do with this platform would be to take off and do um, spiral ascents and descents for doing um, profiling of the thermodynamics and kinematics of the atmosphere, or sometimes we would do a stepped ascent if we were needing to loiter at one particular height for a longer period of time. That's pretty much all I want to say about that. This was the 
Latte experiment, lower atmospheric thermodynamics and turbulence experiment, February, March 2014. So I mentioned that the BAO, we had a lot of different instruments, and then we had the, the UAS operations. It's odd for me to think about the fact that we have a 300 meter tower with extensive systems of guy wires going out in all directions, a tower that's been on the aerological charts for 30 plus years, and the FAA told us that we're going to fly right beside it. If we were to go any higher than 120 meters, then we would be threatening um, civil, av civil aviation. So we were restricted to that height, but there it is. And this is a picture from the field, and I like this one because everybody looks bored. So when everybody's bored and you're doing autonomous flights with an autopilot, that's when things are going well. When people are excited, that's when you know you're having trouble. Okay, so we're now, you know, we're, we're, we're building steam, we're getting a bit more sophisticated in our methods. And so this is CloudMap, the collaboration leading operational UAS development for meteorology and atmospheric physics. And it's a joint project by these four institutions, Oklahoma State University, University of Oklahoma, University of Kentucky, and University of Nebraska. So we are just finished our first year in a four-year um, project. And we had our first field campaign up in northern Oklahoma at the home of the Oklahoma State University in, in Stillwater. And I think this may have been one of the largest UAS field campaigns conducted, especially for UAS um, for, for weather observations. So that's <clears throat> a, you know, a group picture with different platforms out in the field. Uh, we had a whole range of topics that we were exploring. So we here's some of the numbers. We had um, 187 um, rotary wing vehicles, 54 fixed wing vehicles, had some drop signs, a rocket, had about 25 total flight hours over the span of like two and a half days, um, about 241 flights. So that's pretty, pretty amazing, actually. Think that you know, we could go out there, four teams, coordinate among ourselves, operate all these vehicles, and not one crash. We had one vehicle have some technical problems on launch, not us, it was another, another university, and they came down and had a, had a bumpy landing, but no collisions in air. I want to show you this video because this is something which we just pretty much put together on the fly in the field. We were standing beside our colleagues at University of Kentucky, and they were flying um, this fixed wing aircraft here, and they were doing circles and doing um, profiles, kind of like I was describing we used to do with our aircraft. And then they, then they had two, and they were flying around in, in circles of different radii. And so we suggested to them, what if we take our our copter, fly underneath you guys, go up right through the middle of your operations, come back down and, and come back. They said, all right, we'll give it a go. So in order to have this flight in place, we, had, we were activating three different separate COAs. We had three different pilots in command, and each one had their own respective spotters and observers, and the aircraft were flying completely um, autonomously. So I think we probably couldn't pull this off if you had somebody actually flying it by hand. And this is just a little loop showing the trajectories of this aircraft. So there's the, the one aircraft getting into place. It's flying at circles. And there's our aircraft. We fly up to, um, I think it was 300 meters. And then we land, and then they're still flying. In retrospect, we should have made another flight, but you know, it was the first time out in the field. We're going to repeat this, this operation next summer. Then we'll probably get a bit more elaborate in what we're willing to risk. Um, we're still comparing the data. Again, I mentioned to you that this is a kind of a 30,000 foot view, so I'm just hitting a lot of the high points of um, different things that you can do. But I showed this video to NASA, who's putting together their, their um, UAS traffic management system, and they were, they were quite interested, in, and now we're, we're partnering with them on developing some flight deconfliction software. This is an example of one flight that we have from our vehicles. So 
if you look on this little, okay, this is a toy. I have to admit it. This is our one of our first vehicles that we're flying. It's nothing more than an Iris Plus from 3DR. Um, on each leg, we have different sensors, and so in these trajectories, the upward triangles show data sampled on the ascent, and the downward facing triangles are data collected on the descent, and the different colors are showing the four different sensors. And there's still a bit of spread here. We're, we've already learned a lot since we flew this flight already in June of 2016. We're um, tightening up the uncertainties in these um, measurements, but I mean, you can kind of see already there's a pretty steep surface inversion uh, at this particular time. This was just around the time this, the sun was coming up. We can't fly unless it's civil, um, tw civil daylight, and so as soon as we hit that point, then we were on the, on the rise. So that'd be about 5.30 in the, in the morning. And then we flew over, you know, the course of time. This goes from 10.30 to 14.30, and this shows the, the temperature, this inversion, as it starts to um, burn off. Um, no surprises here, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the, the structure that you can see by flying this aircraft, which, I mean, these, the one I've showed you, the whole platform only cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Sensors were a couple hundred dollars, and then, you know, then you're off. But, you know, we wanted, we were, this is just a, a test case to show the types of measurements that you can make, and now we're building a more robust platform, which I'll show you. This is the humidity, and these are some winds measurements that we collected, which I'll talk a bit more about in just a second. <clears throat> so, okay, that was cloud map. Now let's look at EPIC. This is going to happen in spring of 2017. Uh, we're going to have as an anchor site the DOE Arm Southern Great Plains site up in northern Oklahoma. And then we, based on <clears throat> what the National Forecast Office in Norman tells us, we're going to set up another operations at one of these mesonet sites. And I'll talk more about the mesonet sites in just a little bit. So, for example, if you were to have a, a dry line coming through or a front coming through, depending upon the angle of orientation, we would like to set up a second station so that we can do a transect through it. So we're, the idea would be to have our vehicles doing vertical takeoff and landings at about 2,500 feet at this site. Another measurements up at this other site that's going to be selected by the uh, forecast office. And then CU Boulder is going to be flying, oh, I said Tempest, it should be Twister. They're similar platforms. They're going to be flying transects back and forth between these two, and then we'll be using those for looking at um, convection initiation. Um, I already mentioned the fact we have the center. And the center is meant to be doing more than just atmospheric research. It's about enabling any types of research on the campus of OU, which can be um, strengthened by autonomous sensing and sampling. Of course, right now, I would say that 80% of our efforts are on the atmosphere, but you want to broad that out. OK. I would like to show you how we would like to extend the Oklahoma Mesonet. And this gets into an idea of how we could take these measurements into operational um, domain. <clears throat> so the state of Oklahoma has 120 um, surface observation stations. Each one is 10 meters tall. They they're pretty much follow the World Meteorological Organization's standards for um, being a surface station. And here, at this dot, this is the Norman OU Airport. If you come down a little bit, there's a station here called Washington, and the University of Oklahoma has a field station down there. <clears throat> it's called the CAFE's Kessler Atmospheric and Ecological Field Station, and that's where we're doing a lot of our early testing of our, our UAVs. <clears throat> so here's the concept that we're advocating for. Here we see a picture of a 10-meter tower. It has um, sensors at about 1.5 and 2 meters, and then up at 9 meters and 10 meters. Um, it provides data every five minutes. It's a tremendous asset for the meteorological community, for the farming community, and you know, first responders. But you're limited to 10 meters. What if you can put a station 
at the surface that's unattended. This is not permitted now. The FAA will not allow us to fly unattended, but we're starting to put together all the infrastructure such that if we ever get the green light, or when we get the green light, that we could actually fly unattended. So at this point, we do everything manually. We're now developing the robotic system so that it can operate unattended, but still while having people out in this field watching that nothing goes awry. I compare it like having a driver in a driverless car, just in case something goes wrong. Um, it would come out of its little shed, go up, height to be determined, what would I like to fly to? Um, I guess I'm going to have to be pragmatic and say that I'd like to fly to about 1,000 to 1,500 meters. Whether or not the FAA is agreeable with that is another question, um, but we think that that's a reasonable height to try to get up to. Um, if you're all familiar with FAA, airspace is always notched out into inverted wedding cakes. So we're trying to couch this whole concept in a way that FAA can easily get their head around. And so we decided to do an inverted wedding cake here and show that here's our little tower. This might be our staging area. And then we would um, take off and then maybe allow the vehicle to roam around a little bit in this box up here. But probably more likely, we're just going to be doing you know, vertical takeoffs and landing and doing um, profiling of the atmosphere from the surface up to the up to the whatever predetermined ceiling is. So we're going to be focusing on pressure, temperature, humidity, and horizontal winds, but we're also going to be eventually looking into to gas sampling and, and other types of measurements. <clears throat> so I, I showed you the toy that we're flying. So this is the actual platform that we've just built at OU. We've just last week got it um, certified to be airworthy. It's built uh, based on the specifications that were given to us by NOAA for this EPIC um, program. But this will also lend itself well for this extended 3D mesonet um, concept. It's meant to be able to design to withstand 40 knot winds, but we have it spec so we think it can withstand, withstand 50 knots. Um, we want to be able to get winds from the platform and so by the orientation of the platform, we'll be able to know what the winds are. But to do that, you need to know its position quite precisely. So we've, we've implemented differential GPS, which will give us about um, accuracy of its positioning within two to eight centimeters. Um, it's using pretty conventional off-the-shelf autopilot system called the Pixhawk. And then we just need to outfit it with the appropriate sensors. Finding the appropriate location for the sensors can also be challenging because you want to keep them aspirated, but you don't want to have too much um, crop wash. Crop wash, you don't want to have it experiencing heating from the vehicle. So we're doing a series of measurements right now inside of an environmental control chamber to find the, the best location. These are some of the specs for the vehicle in case that kind of thing interests you. Um, we have a max cruise speed of about 51 knots. It weighs about 12.7 pounds. Um, climb rate about 3,300 feet per minute. And we think we should be able to fly about 25 minutes under you know, moderate wind conditions. So there's that. Sensors were geared around this wish list that was given to us by NOAA. And they would like to see temperatures of plus or minus 0 0.2 Celsius, humidities are plus or minus 5, pressures of plus or minus 1 hectopascals, and then wind speeds of half a meter per second, and wind directions of plus or minus 5. These are already better than radiosons provide. And they even told us that if we can't make this, they won't you know, be too bit out of shape. But we think we could, we're, right now we're still optimistic that we could um, meet these specs. After evaluating many different sensor packages, we're um, moving towards the sensor package by IMET. They have a integrated board they call the XF, and then you can swap out different sensor packages. So they have this temperature um, probe, they have a different temperature probe, humidity sensors, 
Um, you can put gas sample sensors in here, GPS, and, and whatnot. So it's, it's kind of nice for a research community in that you can hot swap out um, different sensors. This is what it looks like in a weatherized box. This is not what we'll be using for our on the platform measurements, but it kind of gives you an idea of, of how it looks. So you need to know, is this device working? So we've, we've been spending a lot of time on calibration and validation. This is a mesonet tower that we have just outside of the, the National Weather Center in Norman. This is where I work. And they have several um, aspirated chambers. And so we'll stick the sensors up in, inside these and then collect the data from the um, <clears throat> mesonet folks and do comparisons. So for the IMET sensors, this shows how they track. This is not super meaningful, but it just kind of gives you a warm fuzzy to show that over two hours, um, they track pretty well. But it's not the best calibration. So we actually put the sensors inside of the mesonet's calibration chamber. So it's aspirated to about five meters per second. And they have NIST traceable um, sensors that we can compare the, our, our, our temperature probes to. And after everything is said and done, it's kind of a busy plot. We ranged the temperature from minus 40 to plus 60 in steps of 10 degrees. Um, this is looking at the differences between the NIST traceable standard and IMET sensors. And if you kind of aggregate that according to temperature values, you find out that their, their error is only about 0 0.1 Celsius. So if we can get the right airflow, minimize the solar heating on these sensors, then we think that we can meet the no specs on that. We're still evaluating the humidity sensors. So for validation, what we do is we take the platforms out and we fly them next to um, one of these mesonet towers. So they'll just sit there and, and loiter, and then we'll collect the data off of the mesonet tower and see how well they compare. There might be a better way to do this in the future, but this is something that's easily accessible to us for now, and it's you know, giving us um, good measurements. Um, I mentioned to you the fact that we can get winds. So <clears throat> at 10 meters on this tower, we have a Captain Vane um, anemometer. And so here's how we're working the wind retrieval. We use the orientation of the platform. So how the platform is yawing, pretty much, we, okay, I should mention, you, get, you instruct the vehicle to stay fixed at a given position. And, and it's, it tries to maintain a uh, certain latitude and longitude position while going up and down. So if the winds come, it does everything it can to hold position. So it starts tipping into the wind. And it turns out that the inclination angle is related to the wind speed. If you take the inclination angle, um, the square root or tangent of that angle is proportional to the wind speed. And then the yaw of the platform will give you the um, direction. So these are very, very preliminary. But this shows you the height we were flying at, about 10 meters to match the tower. We, this is our yaw. We actually rotated the vehicle just to kind of see what effects different, um, the different shape of the platform might have on calculating these wind calculations. And this is an inclination angle. And again, very preliminary, but the blue is from the mesonet, and the red is from the, um, we derived from using this uh, technique. We have, a, we're, we have a way of improving upon this. We just haven't implemented it yet. And then this is the direction. So this is going to give us pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind. <clears throat> if we want to move towards a fully autonomous system, then we definitely have to put a lot of risk mitigation um, things into place. So right now, we are at OU building a low-cost detect and avoid radar. And it should be operational maybe early next year. And then we're going to put it out at, at our OU airport and start tracking general aviation aircraft that come in. The idea is that it's very low cost. Um, we're not trying to know exactly where an aircraft is. We just want to know if an aircraft comes within our 
geofenced area. So imagine that the UAV is doing vertical profiles in this area. And imagine that the FAA has said, yes, you may operate in this space. Somebody comes in with a GA um, aircraft and doesn't heed the fact that we have the right of way. We have to defer the airspace to the manned aircraft. Aircraft comes in, radar sees it, command gets sent to the aircraft, land, and then we've deconflicted the airspace. This is one risk mitigation. We're also going to be putting on transponders, ADSB, um, and also you know, visual cameras, but I don't need to go into all that. Okay. We're starting, we're starting to set up this station at Kessler, this Washington site, as a prototype of what a 3D mesonet station will look like. We're starting to build the robotics, the automatic charging stations, the detect and avoid radar. We've got the trailer out. Um, so we're moving forward with this. This is something that we're definitely committed to pulling, pulling off and, and taking to the next level. As a preliminary of developing a 3D mesonet, we're currently in discussions with different landowners and organizations to develop a transect. So we might pick a few uh, windows of opportunity and we would set up maybe a vertical profiling station down here in south of Oklahoma, one at OU, one at OSU, and then one up here in northern Oklahoma, and then start giving these data into the models and maybe start even with some very basic Aussies. So there's a lot of work to be done, but you know I think that we have a very targeted path forward. We've been talking with the FAA, and they told us that they're not inherently against us pursuing this plan. A lot of times the FAA is against certain unmanned aircraft system operations because they put people's lives at risk. But they've already recognized that by not doing this, we're putting people's lives at risk by not being able to improve our weather forecast. So they see that. Um, the fact that we're operating in cylinders as opposed to trying to populate the whole you know, national airspace system with our vehicles, they like that. The fact that we're putting in our different risk mitigation pieces in place, they like. So between these discussions, which make us optimistic that we can probably move, at least we're optimistic that we can have an operational system. Um, and we'll have to see what the Aussies provide us as far as how many of these stations we might need to populate. But this could be a sandbox, so to speak, as we start moving forward to developing a national mesonet. So maybe the national mesonet would also have these um, profiling networks. But of course, you probably don't need 120 stations populated with UAVs, but that's something that hopefully the Aussies can help inform. OK. So weather UAS at OU, um, just kind of summarizing, this instrumented UAS is being yield, um, developed to fill this measurement gap. I think, hopefully I've made the point, if you didn't already know it, that this region of the atmosphere is woefully undersampled. And of all the different sensing technologies, I think this one's quite promising, but of course there's no silver bullet. There's no panacea. This would be a network of networks approach. So this would be one component of a larger system. Um, a nice aspect of this is that you can have different payloads you know, based on different sensing needs. So you could use the same platform for doing atmospheric monitoring, land, take off again and start doing precision agriculture. Or if you want to just stay focused on weather, you could imagine a scenario where you have a, let's keep the operational vehicles out of the picture. Let's say you have a, a very robust platform that goes off in the storm chasing vehicles and they're interrogating the environment around a, a storm. This would never happen, I think, unattended. This, you always have spotters and people involved in this scenario. Let's say the storm has passed. Now you, got, you might need to go into first responder mode in search and rescue. Um, sometimes the people in Oklahoma will use the news helicopters to assist in deploying first responders because sometimes you know the the landscape is unrecognizable so the first responders don't know how to get to street 
intersection because all the road signs are knocked out, all the houses are destroyed. So the weather sometimes the news helicopters help um, direct first responders where to go, but they're loud. Sometimes they've had to shoo them away because they were needing to listen for cries of help of people trapped under rubble. But you know, if you could go into a first responder mode with UAVs, with cameras, and maybe IR sensors, um, so now you're in a first responder mode. And say that segment's done. Now you have to do your damage assessment. Send out the UAVs again. It could be the same platform, but now they're just outfitted differently with sensors. So, um, so a lot of, I think, a wide ranging benefits for the meteorological community. Now, I do have to say this. I think it's very incumbent upon me to make this chart. There's such a thing as a hype cycle. So this is, this is my let the buyer beware um, before I wind down. And this is a recognized way of tracking new technologies. So you have the technology trigger, and then there's a peak of inflated expectations. Then there's that trough of delusion, delusionment, slope of enlightenment, then you get the plateau of productivity. Um, anybody want to, well, so you need to transition from the peak of inflated expectations over to the plateau of productivity. Anybody want to guess where UAS is on this curve? <laughs> right at the, right at the peak of the, and this is not, this is some actual organization that collects these data. And then there's all types of technologies on 3D printing to, you know, I can't remember them all populated along this curve. I just showed the um, autonomous vehicles. So we don't want to oversell this. I think there's a danger in overselling it. But still, still, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that this will be a significant player in the future of um, weather monitoring. So how are we doing? 42 minutes. So with that, I will close and show. This is a shot from the Kessler Atmospheric and Ecological Field Station. The cow was not impressed, but made a good backdrop for our operations. And there you can see the, the UAS in flight, um, collecting weather data out in the field. So with that, I'll conclude and see if you have any, any questions about this, this topic. Are there any questions? Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. I was curious about um, these autonomous stations that you're looking to develop. You know, with all that infrastructure charging and the radar, what kind of cost point or price point are you expecting for something like that? That's difficult to say. I'll try to give it my best estimate. I'll take um, that. <laughs> Because, you know, as you're well aware, you know, production costs drive down actual cost of the systems. We think the high pole in the tent is going to be the detect and avoid radar. We think we can get that one at 10K. I think that will be pretty good. Then the vehicle itself would be probably on the order of 4K. Um, then the sensors might come in at several hundred dollars. Then we would need the um, computer systems for doing the analyzing, crunching the data. Then the charging station. So I'm gonna. This is a. This is a wag, but I'm gonna say 30. I'm gonna say 35K. But I could. You know, caveat emptor there too, because that's we won't know until we do it. We have a, we're we're trying to build our first one, including non-recurring engineering costs and yada yada for about two hundred thousand. That's something money we've been able to, to get to build the first one. But um, if you ask me this time next year, I can give you a better estimate. But that's at least that's a number I threw out. <laughs> Any other questions, Wanda? Uh, staying on that peak of inflated expectations, um, may I uh, venture to ask you about your opinion of UAS's, their value for the storm penetration? 
you know, collecting data from within the store, you know, convective store. <clears throat> Do you want your vehicle back after the? <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as it's dispensable. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you may know that the um, Naval Research Lab is developing their cicada. I don't know if you heard about that or not. It's basically a, it's a flying circuit board. It's about the size of a, of a compact disc. And they are able to fly, I don't know, I think about an hour. They have a GPS in them. You know, they can have flight control surfaces. They have a motor. And um, I, I think they're rather precise in how well they can fly. I, I can share the story with you that somebody told me at a conference. Um, they had launched one from an airplane. And it was coming down. It was supposed to land at a certain spot. And so they, they had some, uh, some researchers out, and they were looking for it, trying to find it. They didn't see it. And it was supposed to land in this right here, where they're, where they're standing, of course. And I don't know why they're standing right where they're supposed to land. But somebody felt that, oh! And he actually <laughs> you hit, him, hit him in the, in the, in the rear. Which, but, so it landed right where it was supposed to. Um, but they're, they're relatively cheap, and they're meant to they have dispensing tubes. And so they can just shoot them out, tuck, 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 tuck. so it'd be almost like a, a, um, a drop sign, but you know, with very precise maneuverability. And I'm working on a platform with Piaseki Aircraft um, Company. This is funded by NOAA US Program Office for doing hurricane research, and it's called the Wimbrel. And it also it would shoot out of um, drop sign tubes, and then it has two hinge points on the wings, the wings would fold out and then it would have a flight time of about two hours. It would also fall into the ocean, um, be biodegradable, but then it could collect very um, precision data as it's coming down. So that is a scenario. But actually flying into the storms, what I would am advocating for is shooting rockets. Why? Because rockets are fun. And <laughs> they're relatively inexpensive. And you could, you could get your payload into the the storm and have it telemetry the data back. Uh, maybe it could even be like a Lagrangian drifter, and then, and then you know, float around in there until it gets covered in, in ice and what have you, and become a part of a, you know, hail core. But those are some options. But actually flying a big enough aircraft and trying to get it out the other side, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about that in the near term. But for surveilling in the vicinity, I think that has a lot of merit. Um, great fun. Have you? I, I know a number of groups that are building similar objectives. Um, have you, you thought about coordinating activities? I know uh, groups like Scripps have invested a lot in in uh, this technology yep. and uh, kind of learning so that everybody doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, great, great point, and that's part of. The purpose for this professional society that's now been created, this ISARA, International, oh, what's it stand for? Society for Atmospheric Research Using Remotely Piloted Aircraft. That's what it stands for. And it's an international community, it's mostly in Europe still, but it's starting to come over to the US. Ours was, the meeting we hosted was the first one in the US, and I was talking to the people from Scripps um, during that meeting. And then, as I mentioned, um, there's special sessions being hosted at the AMS annual meeting where we've learned a lot from talking to each other. And there was actually a special session at the um, AIAA, it's the Aeronautical, I forgot what it stands for, but we also were able to trade, you know, swap trade secrets. So we are communicating with each other. Um, I don't think there's been, well, the fact that we have four universities partnering together is maybe a, a nice first step. But at some point, you do need to go back into your own garage and, and tinker and build your thing, but you don't want to do it in a vacuum. So yeah, there is this, this handshaking going on. Any other questions? First comment, EOL has a room for that cow. <laughs> Call it barn. So, okay. 
So, so how? <laughs> <laughs> so, so how? What's the altitude this this vehicle can can go? I probably missed that part of the film. Well, no, I didn't say it. So, I can tell you that we have permission currently <clears throat> through COAS to fly to three thousand feet. Three. Three. Three thousand feet. That's what the FAA has granted us. Um, for the NOAA project, we're going to fly to 2,500 feet. Um, for the little vehicle that we've been using for our initial testing, we took it to 2,000 feet, but then it was running out of battery. Oh. So that was about, but again, this was you know, a toy that we were just putting instruments on. For the more robust one that I showed that should be able to withstand 50 knot winds, we don't know how high it can go. Um, it, it, it will e easily exceed 5,000 feet, but you know we haven't um, pushed it to its limits. So that's one downside of using rotary wing vehicles for doing these types of measurements is that they're very inelegant. You know, they the, the aeronautical engineers say they beat the air into submission, whereas a you know a fixed wing aircraft is very graceful and it has a very long flight time, but for doing unattended operations, I think capturing that vehicle is a bit problematic, so we'll probably have to rely on rotary wing. But if you're going to be doing deployments where maybe you're out in, in chaser vehicles and maybe traveling out with the, um, the storm chasing radars, there's nothing that says you couldn't hand launch a vehicle, maybe increase its uh, duration and altitude. But mind you that right now everything is visual line of sight. So um, little platform. That little one we flew up in Sweden. We got it up to a kilometer, but we could just barely see it. Barely see it. Um, so that's that's unless we get beyond visual line of sight, then that's going to be our big limiting factor. So, so follow-up question: Do you see this technology one day can re replace sounding? No, no. I, I think just because of the height. You know, getting up to 200 hectopascals is going to be, <laughs> going to be difficult for a for a UAV, unless it's a some global hawk or something like that. But it's actually for logistical measurements. I think this sounding. I I don't try to look for one technology supplanting another. I see them, you know, meshing together, and, and maybe you don't get adequate sampling in the lower atmosphere from the soundings because of the fact they're still pendling, they're still coming into their equilibrium. So that's where I think the UAVs could really complement them. Also, I don't think you would need as many as many observations as you start going up higher as it starts becoming a bit more homogeneous. That's my opinion. Okay. Any other question? One last question over there. Thanks, Phil, for the presentation. So you've been showing some comparison of uh, potential temperature profiles. Uh, I'm guessing mean mean values. So uh, I don't recall you mentioned the uh, temporal resolution of the sensor you're developing. So I would like to know: is it capable of measuring turbulence? And uh, have you compared to I don't know, TGE or energy spectra to some tower sonic anemometer? Yeah, this is uh, for the um, fixed wing aircraft. There are groups flying uh, multi-hull probes um, for doing turbulence type measurements. Um, I would be a bit hesitant to try to do turbulence measurements on a rotary wing vehicle just because of it being you know, quasi-stationary and the air that's trying to sample being perturbed by the actual rotors. But um, that one group from University of Kentucky that, that we were flying inside their circles, they were flying multi whole probes and doing turbulence measurements, and they have some nice data. The group at Oklahoma State University is doing that, and there's others that, that are doing um, turbulence measurements. We we haven't moved into that direction yet ourselves, but um, that's definitely something that can be done. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. That was excellent.